Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So, uh -huh. okay. Uh, I will talk about standards of CO2, of course, the methodology we are using to measure FTIR and the influence, I will say, the things that can influence the FTIR measurements uh, and the things that can give a bias in the FTIR. So here the central thing is that the CO2 continue increasing, as everyone knows. Last year, the increase was of 2.87 micromole per month. So if we want to monitor those, the, that increase, and more importantly, if we want to verify how these emissions are impacting background concentrations, then we need to measure better. That's why NMIs are developing better and better CO2 standards in air. Uh, but how well do we need to measure CO2? That's the important thing. And uh, how well locally and how, how well globally? There are these um, global systems that need to measure with a, I would say, uncertainty of 0.1 micromole per mole in the northern hemisphere. And what is the contribution of the Gas Analysis Working Group during the last year to these efforts? Well, the Gas Analysis Working Group has been working very hard to underpin WMO efforts and other networks. In 2003, we organized the CCQMP 41 comparison. That is very interesting because in this comparison, we use exclusively GC TCD. And the uncertainty, the spread of the result was of around 0.5 micromole per mole. Three years later, there was another comparison where we're using GCFID and optical systems start to take over. The uncertainties dropped nearly to 0.2 micromole per mole. And last year, the BIPM organized the, GC, the CCQMP120, where nearly half of the institute used optical systems. The reference values standard uncertainty dropped up to 0.05 micromole per mole. And this is important to remark because four independent standards of CO2 to have no impact on precise CO2 measurements, we need to have an uncertainty of 0.03 micromole per mole. Then the global networks will only have the contribution of uncertainty of the system itself and not of the standards they are using. And this comparison, as I say, just be completed last year, and we were very happy to be able to demonstrate that CO2 standards drop it by the uncertainty by a factor of 10. Now let me say a few words about the comparison we organized uh, last year. So that we use is a GCFID that is uh, not sensitive to pressure burdening effects or isotopic compositions of the mixtures of CO2. And then we use an FTIR at the same time. Why an FTIR? Because more and more laboratories around the world are using this optical system. So it's very important for everyone to know which are the potential sources of uh, bias in these systems. And to correct the uh, mismatch between the isotopic uh, composition of each cylinder, we use a delta ray to get the delta value and then correct the FTIR values. But this is a subject of the talk and I will talk more about in a few slides. But first, what is CO2? Well, the CO2, the air we are reading now, contains CO2 around 400 micromole per mole. Well, in this room, a little bit more, 420 probably. And 99% of this CO2 that you are reading is carbon-12, oxygen-16, oxygen-16. Around 1% is carbon-13, oxygen-16, oxygen-16, and these other T10 isotopologues. So to make easier and faster this uh, talk, that we have just a few minutes. Uh, we will not refer to carbon-13, oxygen-16, oxygen-16. We will re refer to 636, 626 as carbon-12, oxygen-16, oxygen-16, and 628 as carbon-12, oxygen-18, oxygen-16. And it's the notation of the spectroscopic guys. So now, this simplified example will show you which are the two effects in the tail of uh, the FTIR, the potential effects that could have the, that we can, that can bias the measurements. The first one is the pressure broadening effect that uh, will have 
here an effect if you are using a reference mixture with a different composition than the sample. Why? Because the particles absorb and emit light, and the absorption and uh, the absorption of the, a particle will be very much influenced by the surrounded particles around. So if the density or temperature of the gas you are measuring is different than the gas you are calibrating for, then you will have an effect in this line, okay? And that the lines will be broad, and probably you will have a mismatch in the fitting of the peak. The second effect is the potential bias due to the isotopic mismatch between the standard reference standard and the sample. And this effect will be that if in your sample, reference sample, you have this amount of carbon-13 and this amount of carbon-12, or this 636 and 626, excuse me, then in your reference you have more 626 than 636, then you will have an automatic bias because some optical systems are only measuring one, the main isotope lock, and no both of them are not corrected for them. So what we have done during the key 120 to avoid the pressure broadening effects is we asked to participants to give us very, very, very gas matrix composition, very controlled gas matrix composition. So we ask them to have this minimum and maximum amount of nitrogen, oxygen, and argon. Like this, we reduce the potential bias by the difference of the gas matrices in the cylinder. Now let me show you how it looks like a real FTIR spectra. So very beautiful for the people that love spectroscopy. <laughs> so this region is the region where CO2 absorbs a lot, the region 2,200. Everything is saturated here. But in this part, we can calculate actually 636 and 628, both isotopologues. And we have this part where we can measure mainly 626 since the other two isotopologues are 300 and 600 much weaker. So when we calculate 6 to 6 here, we also need to correct for the isotope logs and then consider the natural abundance that is used in the Hytron database and other small details. Now, in this uh, field, to differentiate how much I have of each isotope log, uh, we use the delta notation. What is the delta 13C? Delta 13, 13C is the difference of the radio of the sample and the reference normalize it by the reference. You can see it simple like this. And this ratio is that we measure, and this ratio we have it from, in this case, the reference we are using. In our case, we are using conventional values for isotopic ratio CO2 gas produced from a carbonate standard. These are published values, these are very well known values is that we are using for our uh, measurements. Now, what it means and what, why are we using uh, delta values and not more fractions of each isotope log? This example will show it very clear. Suppose that we have a mixture of 400 micromole per mole of CO2 in air. If the mixture has a delta 13C of zero per mil in the VPDV to scale, this will be the mole fraction of each isotope log. For 6 to 6, 393.62. Six three, sorry, 6 to 6, 636, 4.401 micromole per mole, and 6 to 8, 1.64. If this same cylinder, we have it with a delta composition of minus 8.91 per, per mil for delta 13C, then the difference between this and this will be just in the, uh, in the, or in the, in the fourth significant figure. If we go to more depleted CO2, where we have like industrial source CO2, then we will have a small difference. Then if you see that the difference here is very small, so it will be very complicated for us to uh, classify the CO2 mixtures by each isotopolog that is contained, and we decided to use the delta notation. It's much easier to, to say this has a delta 13C of the oxygen, of the, sorry, of the CO2 in the atmosphere, and this from industrial CO2. During our study, we found different kind of CO2 with different delta 13C. So in the nature, we can find that delta 13C values are in the range of minus 50 to five per mil. 
We have CO2 from NOAA at minus eight per mil that they got from this, uh, from this area in the United States. We have CO2 with natural, natural gas well sources with minus seven, minus two per mil. We have also industrial CO2. So if you buy industrial CO2 from a gas company, the most probably is that you will have this delta 13C uh, in, the, in the CO2 you have in your cylinder. And we have also very nice mixtures from MPL that uh, they are doing isotopic mix mixing. So that we have done is we took all the mixtures because in our comparison we have 14 participants and 44 standards, and we measure each of them by delta rate. Then we plot the delta 13C in the VPDV CO2 scale against the delta oxygen 18. And then we have a very nice correlation in these cylinders. Then we were wondering why this didn't match into the plot, into the, I will say, into the prediction bands and then talking to each of these laboratories, we could understand that they were very particular CO2 sources. Now, uh, this is the theoretical bias that you will have if you do not correct the delta 13C in your mixture. And we decide to do a test where we put ourselves in the shoes of a laboratory having two reference mixtures with isotopic distribution of the atmosphere and trying to measure without correction what will be the effect if they have mixtures at minus 35 per mil? But before I will present you the uncertainty budget, you will see a lot of lines, so I don't pretend you to read all this now. Then I did a small summary. And you can realize that measuring by FTIR the CO2, uh, as we did in Kihon 20, you will have three main sources of uncertainty. The first one is the uncertainty of the standards itself. But we are very optimistic since NMIs were able in 15 years to drop their uncertainties by a factor of 10. So we believe these uncertainties will go, still going down until the level of 0.03 micromol per mole. Then we have the effect of the isotopic correction that is the smallest uh, uncertainty contributor here. But it is very small because we correct for it. So if there is a lab trying to do these measurements without doing this correction, then it will be uh, quite hard. And then we have the influence of the pressure building effects. It means the difference in the matrix composition of the gases that we were measuring. So this is still of around 0.01 micromole per mole. And I think also with the evolution of the mixtures of the CO2, then we will be able to have a, a smaller windows for having a very, very close uh, pressure, uh, yeah, gas matrices uh, in, this, in the CO2 standards. Then these are the results. Here we plot the reference value against the response, the ratio of the response of the GCFID. You see a very nice line, everyone is okay. And then we measure these cylinders by FTIR, and you see here there are some values of participants that were a little bit off if we don't correct for isotopic uh, composition. And if we correct using these delta values, you see the line, is, uh, the values line much better in the line. You will see it's very hard to see here, but I prepare another plot much more clear <laughs> for you. So here we plot the isotopic abundance of each mixture against the difference of the corrected FTIR minus the reference normalized by the reference. And then you will see here is minus eight per mil, here is minus 40 per mil. And you will see the further we get from the atmospheric isotopic composition that we use to do this exercise, the, the biggest is the bias. That's the very important outcome. And now we try to see if with the corrections we did, we don't have any issue, and exactly. We succeed now with our FTIR, we were able to measure, doesn't matter which CO2 mixture, and doesn't matter which, uh, which delta 13C and oxygen 18, because we were able to correct for the isotopic uh, differences. Now, let me, see, let me say a few words more about my future work and uh, the work of my team at the VIPM. So, as you know, radio measurements are very important for the atmospheric community because it's the way they try, they look and they trace back the sources of CO2. If, they, if it is industrial CO2 in a cloud, if there is natural CO2, this is well CO2, leaks, etc. And also, the um, uh, global atmospheric community is looking for having better standards for isotopic composition. 
We have been working very hard on this subject with our invited guests at the BIPM, our secondees, and we wanted to produce a facility with the objective to prepare samples for comparing accuracy for isotope ratio measurements. So the state of the art of this facility is that we can now measure delta 13C with this system, that is a carousel system that we call, with a standard uncertainty of 0.02, per mil, and for oxygen also for O2, O per mil. This is possible thanks to the um, special capabilities that we have developed to have this very, very small standard uncertainty. Now, conclusions. So, FTIR, and of course, other spectroscopic methods can provide a coercive more fractions measurements of CO2 in air with uncertainties of 0.05 micromole per mole even with the standards of different isotopic, isotopic radios, if this is corrected for. Gas matrices composition needs to be carefully controlled to avoid biases from pressure broadening effects. And finally, precision of optical laser-based isotope radio measurements is now approaching those of mass spectroscopic ones, enabling a meaningful comparison of methods. Thank you very much, and I will let you with this very, uh, Philip, can you? nice uh, image and video. And of course, I want to thank the Gas Analysis Working Group, and this is a very beautiful image from NOAA from CO2. Thank you.